Well, hello there, everybody, and um, welcome to May 2021. Uh, spring gets into its stride. We take a look at what's going on in the sky. Now, a few events. Um, the IAA have decided that we're going to carry on um, some monthly events through the spring and summer, as we're not able to, uh, unfortunately, have barbecues and solar days and stuff that we would normally have during the summer. So we're going to carry on the Zoom talks to keep the wheels turning until normality returns, hopefully not too long from now. Um, so you'll see our videos. If you go to our website, irishastro.org, uh, and there's a red button up towards the top left there that takes you to our YouTube channel, uh, Irish Astronomy slash Videos. And there's a fair number of videos including this one in due course um, on, on there so uh, and include some of the talks that we've had during uh, the lockdown period as well. Um, other people doing things, um, Amar Observatory and Planetarium are running a number of online events. Um, keep up to date with them on their new website, a spanking new website, looks really good, um, www.armar.space and we're hoping that um, before too long uh, friends up at the Om Dark Sky Park and Observatory, that's omdarksky.com. Uh, they will be uh, a opening for events hopefully before much longer as well. It's been uh, been over a year since they were hoping to open, but of course um, events got in the way of that. Now then, to take our customary look at the sun, um, there are currently some spots on the sun, small ones, but... Uh, it is solar cycle 25 kicking into action. There's got a couple here, um, active regions 2818, 2020 and 2821, sorry 2820 and 2821. Um, but otherwise the sun is looking fairly blank. But we look at these stats here. Um, now of 2021 so far, there have been f only 41 spotless days and that's 34% of all days have been spotless. Um, compare that to 57% last year and 77% the year before. That 2019 minimum was the deepest minimum since 1913. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, cycle 24 is, is ramping up gradually. If you look at uh, what happened last time, cycle 24 it went from 73% of spotless days to 71, then suddenly down to 14. And we're probably getting towards that sort of... Uh, 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 2010 time and the aurora sort of kicked off shortly after that so uh, hopefully there will be um, a, a few things to see um, in, the, in the aurora skies before much longer. Now a look at the planets. Um, Jupiter and Saturn are becoming visible again um, in the early hours of the morning. Um, Jupiter is visible in the southeast, as it Saturn is not far from it. They're in Aquarius and Capricorn, respectively, um, and they'll be rising around about uh, three and four o'clock, um, and earlier than that towards the end of May. So uh, May becomes uh, easier to see those planets. Mars is still quite bright up in Taurus. Um, it is small because it's moving away from the Earth now, um, but uh, still still quite visible, um, and of course. Um, we must take note of the fact that uh, they were successful. I did talk last time um, about the attempt coming up, as it was then, to um, fly a powered aircraft on another planet for the first time. And uh, that's 118 years from flying the first powered flight on the Earth, the Wright brothers uh, at, in North Carolina, and, um, and flying the helicopter on Mars. It's now made, as of this moment, three successful missions and it seems to be working very well, so they'll get more adventurous with that, hopefully, and uh, and get some great pictures back to us. So that's um, what's going on on Mars. Um, Venus is coming back now. It's, uh, it's low in the post-sunset sky um, to the west and uh, that's, that's well worth looking at. That gets better as the month goes on. Uh, and we do get a good look at Mercury as well. This is the best apparition of Mercury so far, this, or indeed for the whole of this year. Um, Any time from the 1st of May onwards, um, with a good western horizon, do not start looking until the sun has set, because that's not safe. Um, but you should be able to find Mercury quite low in the twilight. Um, minus one magnitude at the beginning of the month, uh, dropping a couple of magnitudes as the month continues. Um, Uranus and Neptune have both recently passed superior conjunction, that is to say uh, they're behind the Sun and they've not yet moved far enough away from it to be readily visible to us. 
Now then, the International Space Station was incredibly disappointing in April because we hardly got to see it at all. Um, but, uh, but May makes up for that in buckets because we can see it pretty much every day um, for the whole of May. It starts off with a sequence of, uh, of morning passes, sort of 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning from the 1st of May onwards, um, all quite bright. Um, some of them very bright, minus 3.4 there on the 7th. Um, that's 49 degrees, and that's about as high as it gets. Um, then this long sequence of both morning and evening passes, sort of intertwined between the two of them. Um, and then it comes back to a series of evening passes um, t towards the end of the month. So uh, the whole month we can see the space station. There are lots of opportunities to see it, and uh, some opportunities to see it, say, you know, four times in, in a 24-hour period, uh, which is quite... Uh, quite spectacular. So that's uh, the International Space Station. Now, one thing about it is that at the moment there are 11 astronauts on the ISS because the, the Crew-2 um, Space Dragon has taken another four astronauts up. Um, the Crew-1 Dragon has not yet returned. It was due to return a couple of days ago, but it's so far... It's going to stay till tomorrow, the way things look at the moment. This is all due to the uh, uh, the weather. Not a problem with the spacecraft, but a problem with the weather at the, at the uh, designated landing site um, of Florida. Um, and, of course, the ISS was only actually ever designed for six astronauts. But, uh, they've, by using the Dragons as additional accommodation, they've, uh, they've spread out for 11. It's not the record. Um, there have been 13 astronauts on the space station at one stage. Now we have a meteor shower coming in um, early in the morning on the 6th of May. The moon is pretty much out of the way by that point. Um, but it's, it is an early hours in the morning thing. You probably won't see much... Um, in, in the night time um, but you need to be sort of up at about uh, uh, 4 a.m. latest really um, because the sky will start to lighten by that point uh, and you might catch a few Eater Aquarids um, it's not the biggest by any means but what is good about it is that um, what we're doing there why these meteors come about is that um, Earth is passing through the tail of Halley's Comet um, now Halley's Comet of course was last visible um, in 1986 I saw it it was quite a faint apparition but I did see it um, through my father's binoculars um, I wonder if I'll get to see it when it comes round again in July 2061 I mean never say never but I shall be just short of my 100th birthday at that time um, so if I do get to see that I shall be very happy um, but uh, that's the the Eta Aquarids now then um, they're not far away from Saturn and Jupiter so bear that in mind and there is one captured on a meteor cam in Arizona um, on the 30th of April. So uh, they do exist, and that's a and that's a real fireball of one that that uh, that's up there with uh, some of the brightest stars. So uh, uh, there they are. Now the moon. Let's talk a little bit about the moon. Um, the moon, generally speaking, um, keeps one face turned towards the Earth. And that's because over billions of years, the, the, the interaction gravitationally between uh, the, the, the Earth and the Moon has meant that the Moon rotates on, on its axis in pretty much exactly the same amount of time that it goes around the Earth. Um, however, we don't actually see, as you might think, 50% of the surface because there is a thing called libration which means that the moon still wobbles a bit from side to side and up and down. And we can see uh, bits, bits of the moon at the edges that we don't normally see on certain occasions. And this is one such coming up at the end of the month. On the 26th of May, um, it's possible to see the very edges of a feature of the moon called Mare Oriental. And this is, we miss the very best time. The best time is about eight o'clock in the morning of there, where the moon is virtually full, pretty full. Um, but unfortunately, from Ireland, it will have set about four hours before that. Um, so we won't get to see the very best, but we might get to see something. And uh, your signpost here is this sea here called Grimaldi. Uh, and you can just see there the edges um, of the Maori Oriental. Now, uh, to give you a better idea of what that's all about, um, a couple of years ago, the, um, the folk down at Armagh Observatory and Planetarium 
um, erected uh, over the green at Armagh this wonderful um, huge model of the moon um, and one of the things that was very good about it is that it's accurate not just on the side that we can see but on the side we can't see and you've got to bear in mind that nobody um, even knew what the other side of the moon looked like until a Russian spacecraft went around it in 1959 and of course we've seen much more of it since um, but this model is great because it's got the whole of Mari Oriental here so you can see that's Grimaldi on there that's the same thing and you can just see what you can see here is the edges of Oriental here but this this model shows you the whole thing and it's huge absolutely huge um, some major impact has happened there at some point that's formed those crater walls around it and a, and a Mari at the bottom of it so that's um, Oriental okay now for our look at the night sky in May we're going to start off on the 11th of May, which I've chosen because there's no moon in the sky at that point, so the deep sky looks that much better. Um, 2300, that's about as early as you can start observing in the middle of May, um, simply because there is very little night time left. Um, in fact, in, in June, there is no proper night time at all until um, probably about the beginning of August. So uh, we're really at the sort of the, um, the rag end of the time that we can look at deep sky objects. And we're going to start off looking at the constellation Gemini in the north there, and uh, to the northwest of, of north, that is, uh, the two twin stars, Castor and Pollux. Um, Castor is a multiple star of, of six stars, and Pollux is a sort of a slightly brighter version of the sun. We can't quite see the rest of the, of the constellation at the minute. Um, we'll move along and we'll see the bright star Capella. Now, Capella is one of the brightest stars in the sky. It's a, it's a zero magnitude um, star and it is circumpolar. That is to say, it can be seen all times of the year. And actually, this is about as close to um, sinking into the north as it gets. It never quite gets there, as you see. Um, so that's um, Auriga, this sort of pentagonal shaped thing. And we've got uh, next to um, Capella here, we have this group of this triangular group of stars called the Kids. So that's um, that's Auriga. Next to that we have Perseus um, with the uh, star Murfak there. And uh, that's interesting. There's also, of course, you can't go to Perseus without seeing um, the double cluster here. That's this double cluster here. That's a real gravitationally linked two clusters it's not two different clusters in the same direction um, at, the, at the north end there of Perseus and then we come along to Cassiopeia the familiar W shape um, again quite low in the north there then we go further along and we come to Cygnus, Cygnus the Swan, or the Northern Cross. And an interesting one there actually is this, it's my, one of my favorite objects in the sky, that star there. Not the best time of year to see it because it's quite low down, but that is, uh, that's Alburio, Beta Cygni. And if we zoom right in on that, we'll find that it is a very nice looking double star. Um, the colors unfortunately don't show in Stellarium, um, but it is a beautiful gold color. Uh, with a sapphire blue partner uh, magnitudes three and five thereabouts and it looks even in a small refractor telescope that looks absolutely superb then of course we have Lyra Lyra the harp with its bright star Vega Vega is the second brightest star in the sky at this time of year Arcturus is just a teeny weeny bit brighter um, and, and the colour contrast between them, Vega is blue, Arcturus is orange, it's well worth looking at. And so that's uh, then the third member of the Summer Triangle, we looked at Vega and Deneb there. Um, Altair is somewhere down here and not up yet, it will come uh, more apparent later in the year. Now, a couple of things about Vega, first of all, if we go to this star here, that is Epsilon Lyra. And what we find about Epsilon Lyra, it's, you can see it's a double star. Except that that's not the end of it because each of the stars of the double is itself double. 
so they're very close double there that's double double one and we come back out here again and go to double double two which we see is also double a very very close double actually quite a modest telescope will split those i have i have seen both of those separated in a four inch maksutov cassegrain telescope which wasn't fantastically expensive so just goes to show that you can see a great deal in the sky with fairly modest equipment now i'm going to come right out of here and we're going to move around to ursa major which is very easy to see at the minute because it's pretty much um, right above us um, some scopes will have difficulty looking right above us but uh, if you use a Newtonian on a on an equatorial mount or even a Altaz mount it will go upwards nicely and my favorite star in Ursa Major is Mizar and we'll have a quick look at Mizar Mizar and Alcor are a very good test of eyesight if you've got good eyesight um, you can see them naked eye as two separate stars um, what you can't see naked eye of course is if you go into Mizar closely Mizar is itself a double star and actually as it happens so is Alcor uh, and so is the eighth magnitude star between them so that's a very rich view there okay now then the most important function of course of Ursa Major is finding the way to the North Star um, before GPS and such things um, this is how uh, mariners had to find north they took the two pointer stars at the end of the, the you know the, the dipper here um, Marak and Duby and follow that line up um, about five times the length of the space between the two stars and you will come to Polaris the pole star now then Polaris is not um, in fact the brightest star in the sky which some people think it is it's not it's a it's an ordinary second magnitude star it just happens to sit almost above the north celestial pole and when I say almost I'll show you because it's not quite now there's the north celestial pole there and there's Polaris there it is about three quarters of a degree off uh, absolute center now for most purposes that doesn't really matter um, however when you're um, aligning uh, an equatorial mount with the intention of taking long exposure photographs that difference does matter and what you do is there's a useful pointer in the sky here as well um, is you line the mount up to Polaris and then you offset it three quarters of a degree and that three quarters of a degree, degree just happens to be in the direction of Beta Ursa Minoris here. That's that's Cockab, the orange star there, the second brightest star in Ursa Minor. Polaris is the brightest, so that's that gives you the direction, and you can estimate three quarters of a degree um, with your uh, controls on your scope, and um, that will give you a much better um, polar alignment than just lining it up on Polaris. So there we go. OK, we're going to come back to Ursa Major now and just have a look around some of the deep sky objects in the area, which are quite plentiful. Um, we'll come back initially to uh, to Mizar because that's a good starting off point. Then we'll move over this way. We can see there this faint fuzzy patch. And if we uh, manage to click on that correctly, there we go. this is Messier 101 which doesn't seem to there we are now that's uh, the pinwheel galaxy Messier 101 now that's uh, um, a sort of seventh magnitude galaxy spiral galaxy and uh, looks very impressive it did look a little bit more impressive a few years ago because there was actually a supernova identifiable in there which changed the look of the galaxy quite surprisingly actually um, so that's M101 the pinwheel we come back out to uh, Ursa Major, cross it a little bit into uh, uh, Keynes Venatici. And this object, the other side of the, the handle of the plough here, um, in here is Messier 51. There we are, that's the Whirlpool Galaxy. And 
Now, I was told off about this. I did say um, a while back that uh, M51 was discovered in Ireland, and that's not strictly speaking true. Um, of course, there's a bit of a clue in the name Messier, um, and that is that uh, it was, M51 was identified as a fuzzy patch by Charles Messier. But then some while after, the, uh, the Earl of Ross, who built the great Leviathan telescope, which is now at uh, Burr in County Offaly, um, he was able to see it in enough detail to realise that it was actually a spiral galaxy and indeed it was a spiral galaxy that has collided with another galaxy. Um, so that's uh, Messier 51. Um, eighth magnitude uh, looks quite fabulous. Um, a bit small perhaps. It's, it, is, it is very far away um, so it doesn't actually look that big um, compared to say Andromeda. But uh, it's a very nice galaxy. M51. Okay, moving on down to M63, the Sunflower Galaxy. And uh, that's a thing you can sort of see where they got the name from for that one. It does look a little bit like a sunflower, doesn't it? Um, um, spiral galaxy with many arms. Uh, looks very attractive. Lots of star-forming regions going on in there that we can see. So that is M63. Okay, next one up is uh, Messier 94, the Crocs Eye Galaxy down in uh, Keynes Venetici again. And that's a, a face on spiral, well worth looking at. Okay. Now heading on up back towards uh, the dipper of the plough. And uh, we'll see M106 on the way there. Let's just zoom out to give that some context. There we are, see there's the dipper the handle and we've been on this journey here up to M101, M51, M63 and round through there and we're going back up towards the dipper and what we're going to do next is we're going to go the other side of the dipper where we have two of the finest galaxies in the sky and here's one right so that's Messier 81 let's zoom in on 81 Bode's galaxy it's a beautiful um, slightly side on view of a spiral probably not terribly different from our Milky Way and it so happens that just next to it and they really are next to each other they're very similar distances um, at Messier 82 the cigar galaxy and uh, that's best taken a picture of with a camera that's got some hydrogen alpha sensitivity because there's loads of it coming out of the center of that galaxy that's Messier 82 so we'll leave the deep sky for there, and uh, that's it. So that's all I have to say, apart from stay safe, keep looking up, and thanks for watching.